Hello, in this video we're going to be looking at an argument for a pro-choice position. Actually, we're going to be looking at an extensive criticism of a pro-life position, but out of that criticism will emerge an argument for a pro-choice position. And so we'll be looking at Judith Jarvis Thompson's paper, A Defense of Abortion, and the argument that she makes in that paper. So let's start by reminding ourselves of the anti-abortion argument, the pro-life argument that we looked at in the last module. So. Uh, we're going to look at a slightly different version of it, uh, an expanded version of it, because we'll, it will help to expand it to see how Thompson's criticism interacts with it. So uh, we have Marquis' observation that the embryo and fetus have a valuable future. And then we can say if a being has a valuable future, it has a right to life, and uh, if a, which means that the embryo and fetus have a right to life. And then we can say that killing something with a right to life is prima facie very wrong. And those three premises together, we've basically, the, the two premises on the right, we've split up Marquis' premise. Remember, Marquis says, if a being has a valuable future, then it's prima facie very wrong to kill it. And we've divided that into two. We've said if a being has a valuable future, it has a right to life. And then if you have a right to life, it's prima facie very wrong to kill you. Okay, so then... But proceeding, we can say that embryo and fetus have a right to life, and because killing something with a right to life is prima facie very wrong, we get the conclusion that abortion is prima facie very wrong. Now, in the previous module, what we saw is that perhaps Marquis is wrong about this part of his claim. It's not clear that if a being has a valuable future, it has a right to life. We saw that it's plausible that um, things like the ovum and perhaps the sperm uh, have valuable futures, and yet it's okay to prevent those valuable futures from coming to pass. So, uh, but Thompson's going to take a different tack than the criticism that I offered at the end of the last uh, paper, or last module. She writes, what happens if, for the sake of argument, we allow the premise that the fetus has a right to life? So I was suggesting that Marquis didn't establish that, but Thompson says, let's suppose that he did establish that. How precisely are we supposed to get from that there to the conclusion that abortion is morally impermissible? She observes that almost everyone, including many uh, uh, anti, both sort of anti-abortion, uh, sorry, almost everyone, including anti-abortion proponents, agree that in general a woman has a right to choose what goes on in her body, but there's this fundamental right to life intuition that she thinks is shared by many pro-choice and pro-life people, namely, surely a person's right to life is stronger and more stringent than the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body and so outweighs it. So she says, look, uh, basically everybody, or not everybody, but most people think, yeah, sure, uh, a mother has a, a bodily autonomy, right, because uh, she's a person just like anybody else, but uh, the given... But what's it like to have a fundamental right to life? Well, among other things, or to have a right to life, that right to life outweighs any bodily autonomy claim the mother might have. And so if the fetus and embryo have a right to life, then abortion is wrong. But Thompson suggests that... Um, so, so what that means, right, is, is yeah, women have bodily autonomy on this view, but the right to life uh, overrides the bodily autonomy. And Thompson says this is a mistake. On the one hand... The right to life is, is a strong right. Perhaps it's the very strongest right. Um, but uh, it doesn't have unlimited scope. It doesn't allow you to do anything to maintain your life. And so she thinks that the right to life does not mean, in particular, that you have a right to use another's body for your own survival. You have a right to life, yes. Can you use someone else's body for your own survival? Not necessarily. And in particular, she thinks that uh, bodily autonomy uh, gives you the right to, means that uh, you can prevent others from using your body for their survival. And that means that bodily autonomy limits the extent of the right to life. Uh, within the area protected by the right to life, the right to life may be strongest, but uh, it doesn't let you do just anything, and in particular, it doesn't allow you to use another's body, and that's going to mean that the fetus doesn't have a claim on the mother's body. So, she thinks that, she's going to argue that this premise, killing something with a right to life is prima facie very wrong, she's going to disagree with that premise, as we'll see. She's going to say, well, it, it needs some limitations, and once we limit that premise, we are, the pro-life argument is going to be substantially weakened, and we're going to have a pro-choice argument in its place. So, on the one hand, she is skeptical that the embryo and the fetus always have a right to life. She doesn't think they always do, but she's not going to argue that in her in this paper. She's going to say, no, let's suppose that they do uh, always have a right to life for the sake of argument, and she's going to criticize the 
the other premise, the claim about what it's like to have a right to life. Having a right to life does not necessarily make abortion wrong. So she starts with this example that's supposed to be analogous to abortion. It's the violinist case. So we have this famous violinist, very talented violinist, uh, but who is dying of a kidney disease. And uh, the violinist has a, uh, a group of very wealthy admirers who want to save the violinist because they admire the violinist playing so much. And it turns out that your kidneys um, <clears throat> can help. So uh, they kidnap you and attach you to the violinist in a way that now your kidneys are used to clean the violinist's blood. And um, if you don't unplug for nine months, if you stay attached to the violinist for nine months, the violinist is going to recover. The, ki the violinist kidneys will eventually repair themselves, and then they won't need your kid the violinist won't need your kidneys anymore, and the violinist will survive. But if you unplug yourself from the violinist before those nine months are up, the violinist will die because the violinist kidneys will not have had a chance to recover sufficiently and the violinist will die. So if you detach yourself, you will, you will kill the violinist. If you stay attached, the violinist survives. If you detach, the violinist dies. And so detaching, we can say, will kill the violinist. Nonetheless, Thompson thinks it's very clear that it's ethically okay for you to detach yourself. You do not have an obligation to stay attached to the violinist. What, and so she thinks that this premise, killing something with a right to life, is prima facie very wrong. This premise is false. Uh, you will kill the violinist if you detach yourself, but it's okay to detach yourself, and therefore the premise is mistaken. And that means that the anti-abortion argument fails, that the anti-abortion argument relies on a premise that says, oh, killing somebody with the right to life is prima facie very wrong, but here we have a straightforward counterexample to that. You can, um, killing the violinist is not prima facie very wrong. Now, the uh, pro-life person might at this point reply and say, no, no, it's not ethically okay to detach the violinist. And if the, that pro-life reply is correct, if it is not ethically okay to detach yourself from the violinist, then Thompson's paper fails. And there's something to what the, this reply, so I want to spend a little bit of time in this video um, talking about whether or not that's correct. So is it okay to detach yourself from the violinist? So let's start with a different case to get some uh, distinction going. So we have two cases with a box of chocolates. So you've been given a box of chocolates, you have a brother, and you choose not to share any of the chocolates with your brother. Now we can imagine two variants of this case. One is that while you've been given the well, you have the box of chocolates. Actually, the box was a gift to both of you. It wasn't a gift just to you. And so if the box was given to both of you, then not sharing the chocolates would be unjust, it would be unfair, it would be wrong. Part The chocolates are not yours alone, and so they're partially your brother's, and so when you don't share them, you're violating the rights of your brother. You have basically stolen them from your brother. On the other hand, perhaps the box was just a gift to you and to you alone. In that case, um, you don't violate your brother's property rights if you keep the chocolates for yourself. Uh, and, it, and so in that way, what you do is not wrong. However, it is, in Thompson's terminology, indecent and selfish. So it's, it's ethically bad. It's not great. But it's not wrong. Uh, your brother can does not have a right against you to say, you have to give me uh, some of those chocolates. You can say, no, they're mine, and I don't want to. And... Uh, so not sharing in this case doesn't violate any of your brother's rights. It just devalues your brother's interests and happiness and pleasure. So it's selfish, but it's not wrong, she thinks. So we can distinguish between moral decency and respect for others' rights. You must respect others' rights. You ought to be decent and altruistic and help others. So this is not a utilitarian view. This is some something like a Kantian view, although not exactly. But the distinction seems fairly intuitive, and we can apply it to the violinist case. Let's start actually with a slightly different case, a kidney transplant case. So you have two kidneys, but you only need one to survive. There are people who need a kidney transplant to survive. So you could right now volunteer to have, to donate a kidney, and you would, if you did that, you would go through some uh, medical tests, and then if you pass the medical tests, you would go undergo uh, surgery, your kidney would be removed and transplanted into another person's body. It would be very kind to donate a kidney, but it is not ethically required. At least that's a very strong intuition I think we all share.
Let's consider now the violinist case, uh, where you wouldn't be donating ki a kidney, but you would be loaning, in effect, a kidney. And let's consider not the kidnapping case, but a slightly different case, where you might voluntarily attach yourself to the violinist. Well, it would be very kind to attach yourself to the violinist, but again, it's not required. Um, so, now, what about how does the kidnapping fit into this? Well, being kidnapped does not increase your obligations to the violinist, right? You've had something wrong done to you, and it's not like you now, as a result of something wrong being done to you, have more ethical obligations. And so uh, it would be kind to stay attached, but it's not required, right? If you're not required to attach yourself, and then you're kidnapped, uh, you, your obligations have not increased, and so it's still, uh, it's not uh, required to stay attached. So, um, I think that's a fairly persuasive argument uh, to support our initial intuition that you're not required to stay attached to the violinist. You don't, you're not required to initiate attachment, kidnapping doesn't increase your obligations, and so you're not required to stay attached. Okay, so what this demonstrates is that in the in at least some situations, the right to bodily autonomy takes priority over the right to life. And, uh, um, Thompson gives this other example uh, involving Henry Fonda, who was a, a sort of matinee movie star, movie idol, uh, some time ago, and she says, "Oh well, you know, I'm." She imagines I'm. She's lying on her on her couch, and she's she's about to die. She says, "Well, if only Henry Fonda would come and and um, uh, put his cool hand on my brow, I would feel better, um, and that would be kind of him." But he's not ethically required to. It would be wrong, for example, to kidnap to to go and force him to do that. That would be kidnapping. So, uh, she says that in general, you're not required to s use your body, to sacrifice your body to save another's life. And in many cases, the saving would be, in would be decent, not saving would be indecent, but it's not morally required. The person whose life is in, under, in danger does not have a right to demand that you use your body to save them. So, she thinks the situation is the same with pregnancy and abortion. In many cases, abortion is okay. It's not wrong, but it would be indecent. In some cases, it's not even indecent. Uh, in no way is it ethically bad. And in others, it's not wrong, but it might be very bad in other ways. So here she imagines someone who decides to have a, a, an abortion at uh, seven months just in order to go on a vacation. She thinks that would be maybe not wrong, but it would be quite bad. But in lots of other cases, abortion is going to be um, okay, ethically okay, it's not wrong, and it's not even going to be indecent. So, what she's, and in making this point, she's relying on an analogy between the violinist case and the abortion, so, and pregnancy. So we can imagine that the fetus or the embryo is like the violinist, the mother is like the kidnappee, the fetus and violinist have a right to life, the mother and the kidnappee have bodily autonomy. The kidnappee's bodily autonomy blocks the violinist from using the kidnappee's body to survive, right? The, you're kidnapped, um, your bodily autonomy is what allows you to detach yourself from the uh, violinist, even though doing so would kill the violinist. So the question is then this. The fetus has a right to life, the mother has a right to use her body. In at least some cases, the right to control your own body means that you do not have to, that no one else has a claim on your body, that they don't have a right to use your body. Is the fetus really like the violinist? Is it the case that uh, the fetus's right to life, or supposed right to life, uh, is blocked by the mother's autonomy? Or is it rather that the fetus's right to life is, is uh, the relationship between the fetus's right to life and the mother's bodily autonomy is different than in the violinist case, that in the situation of pregnancy, the fetus does have uh, more of a claim on the mother's body than the violinist has on your body? on the kidnappee's body. So that's the question we're going to have to look at in the rest of this module. Given that the right to life doesn't always give you a claim to use someone else's body to survive, as it doesn't in the violinist case, what do we want to say about pregnancy and abortion? Does the uh, fetus and embryo, for some reason, have a claim on the mother's body in a way that you, as the kidnappee, don't? Or is the fetus more or less like the violinist and not, and, and have and their right to life does not give them a claim on the mother's body. So that's what we'll be looking at in the rest of this unit.